In the history of the ancient world, there's one woman who eclipses all others. Her name has become a byword for beauty, luxury, and excess. But more than that, her story is entwined with some of the most powerful men in Western history. She is, of course, the last pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra. Since her death some 2,000 years ago, Cleopatra has been portrayed as everything from romantic heroine and victim to sexual predator and cold-blooded killer. Over the years, she's been subject to myth, propaganda, and more than a little fantasy. Through two millennia of history, art, and fiction, she has been molded to the fashions and prejudices of the day. And over the centuries, Cleopatra has become a blank canvas on which successive generations have projected whatever image suited their own time. During three decades on British screens, the BBC history series Time Watch attempted to interrogate Cleopatra's story. Along the way, Time Watch took up some of the fiercest debates that surround Cleopatra, how she looked, her relationship with men, and even the thorny issue of her race. The dominant culture does not see Cleopatra as black and does not accept Cleopatra as black. I'll guide you through the ever-shifting sands of Cleopatra's changing image. And by looking through the BBC archives, I'll try to piece together how the myths came about and uncover who she really was. Despite living some 2,000 years ago, Cleopatra still looms large in our public consciousness. It's easy to see why. A young girl who inherited one of the most powerful kingdoms in the ancient world. A pharaoh queen who took on the might of the Roman Empire. Along the way, seducing two of Rome's greatest generals, Julius Caesar and Mark Antony and a woman who took her own life with the help of a poisonous snake. Over the centuries, Cleopatra's been the subject of works by everyone from the great Roman poets, Renaissance authors, through Chaucer, Shakespeare, Victorian music hall, and TV drama. Each in turn has left us with a different image of who she was. Most of us know Cleopatra and her story through the prism of popular culture. It's easy to forget that Cleopatra was a real woman who lived through some of the most important events in our history, events that would help to shape the Western and Middle Eastern worlds. I think Cleopatra's legacy is as one of the very few great women in ancient history. One of the very few times we can point to someone and say, that woman changed the world. And the fact that even a few of those characters exist um, uh, makes them extremely important to us. I think we see Cleopatra differently every time we look at her and when we're looking at her. So I think we will see her very differently from people, say, 50 years ago. It's not necessarily the right Cleopatra, though. We're always tempted, I think, to, to put our own interpretation and see her through the lens of our own history. We use Cleopatra as we want, and it reflects our own assumptions, our own desires about the world, but it tends to be those desires, how we would have liked the past to be and how we'd like the present to be, rather than necessarily how either of them actually are or were. Understanding how and why her myth came about is so important because the reality of her world has been literally buried. Surprisingly, there's little archaeological evidence for Cleopatra's life remaining in Egypt. Cleopatra has fascinated people the world over for centuries, and anything relating to her is deemed newsworthy. 
Archaeologists working in the waters off the Egyptian port of Alexandria have found the remains of a royal city that was home to Cleopatra and her lover Mark Antony. They say the city has lain hidden for 2,000 years on the eastern edge of the ancient harbour. They believe Cleopatra's palace, located on a peninsula nearby, looked directly across the bay to Antony's home. The royal city itself was a network of lavish palaces and temples. This report from our correspondent in Egypt, Jim Muir. It's an underwater museum. For the first time, the whole area has finally been explored and mapped using the most sophisticated modern equipment. Cleopatra lived on this place. She had uh, palaces on this place, and she plays this uh, unbelievable drama between her, Julius Caesar, Antony, and Octavius, uh, exactly on this place. It's certainly true that between the Mediterranean Sea and the modern city of Alexandria, there's very little left of Cleopatra's city. We have some descriptions in the ancient sources, but there's not much that we can actually use to tell what, what her life, what her daily life was like, what life with Antony in Alexandria was like. And I think that does mean that we tend to, we have to rely a lot more on the written sources and a lot more on, um, on our kind of ideas of what should have been like. Even without much tangible evidence to go on, Cleopatra is one of the most recognizable names from the ancient world. But despite the vast power and influence she wielded in her own lifetime, the one thing that stayed with us down the centuries is the legend of her incredible beauty. The idea that Cleopatra was beautiful is now a central part of her myth. The overriding impression many of us share is of Cleopatra as a striking beauty who used her good looks to seduce powerful men. This image of Cleopatra has been handed down through the generations, perhaps reaching its climax in the golden age of Hollywood. In 1934, the legendary filmmaker Cecil B. DeMille joined centuries of other artists, poets and authors in depicting Cleopatra for his own age. Cleopatra is a magic name, a symbol of romance and love, of power and passion and intrigue. Cleopatra has been glorified in all the arts and by writers from Plutarch here to Shakespeare to Shaw. Yet, she still remains a mystery, eternal as the Sphinx. On the silver screen, Cleopatra has been portrayed by some of the most beautiful actresses in history, perhaps most memorably by Elizabeth Taylor in the epic 1960s retelling of her story. Elizabeth Taylor as Cleopatra, Siren of the Nile. Her stunning beauty and notorious intrigue turned the tide of civilization. But where does the Hollywood image of Cleopatra come from? The beauty myth started with the Romans, who, to their dismay, found that two of their greatest leading men had fallen under her spell. In the literature that followed, she's almost without fail being cast as hauntingly alluring. One of the most influential authors who wrote about Cleopatra's life was the biographer and historian Plutarch, who lived in the first century AD. Plutarch is perhaps the least flattering of all ancient writers, but even he paints her as a beguiling figure, as dramatized in this 1983 Time Watch. Her own beauty, so we are told, was not of that incomparable kind which instantly captivates the beholder, but the charm of her presence was irresistible and there was an attraction in her person and her talk together with a peculiar force of character which pervaded her every word and action and which laid all who associated with her under its spell. But Plutarch wasn't the only ancient author who wrote about Cleopatra. 
and it's often the other Roman writers who've held sway. Plutarch unusual in stressing that she wasn't that beautiful. Uh, Dio describes her as the most beautiful of all women, and that's the tradition that gains the ground, really, by the time of Chaucer. She was as fair as is the rose in May and all the rest of it. I think the interest in Cleopatra's beauty is really a, pro a byproduct of the way that she's come to be a figure of the forbidden, especially a, fig a figure of the forbidden to men. Uh, and so she represents all that uh, is forbidden but is longed for because it's repressed. And so, of course, she becomes more and more beautiful the more she's forbidden. The myth of Cleopatra's beauty is now centre stage in all retellings of her story, both in fiction and academic study. To penetrate beneath the veneer of the myth, some have tried to discover her true face, using what archaeological evidence there is. But when new evidence does emerge, the truth doesn't always seem to match up to the legend. Now we know her as the icon of beauty from classical times, a woman whose charms bewitched Caesar and brought down the Roman Empire. But a new discovery suggests Cleopatra was no beauty at all. She apparently had bulging eyes, thin lips and a bad haircut. Robert Hall reports. Well, for confirmation of Cleopatra's beauty, one needs look no further than the bard. Uh, in his play, Antony and Cleopatra, one of Mark Antony's servants says that his master has been turned from a triple pillar of the world into a strumpet's fool by his love for Cleopatra. Well, on this new evidence, Mark Antony may have been a trifle short-sighted. This 2,000-year-old coin does rather shatter the image. Depicting both Mark Antony and Cleopatra, it does the Egyptian queen no favours at all. It's very difficult to find out when this idea that Cleopatra was a great beauty came into vogue. Cleopatra has a very low brow, very hooked nose, and she does look as if she's forgotten to put her teeth in. The image of Cleopatra we can glean from coins like this is a distorted one. Firstly, because the coins themselves are of limited artistic value. Frankly, they were minted rather crudely to our modern eyes. But more importantly, ancient coins like this were more about disseminating a potent iconography rather than showing what their subjects actually looked like. As coins aren't really that useful in getting to the true image of Cleopatra, academics have spent decades searching for other depictions of her on reliefs and, more importantly, statues. There are a number of likely candidates but they need to be matched to known characteristics, as Oxford University's Professor Smith explained for Time Watch. Let me just turn this into profile. Um, what one's looking at is the arrangement of the hair, the center parting, the hair pulled back in these broad melon-like uh, bands here into a large bun at the back. This corresponds precisely to the um, formation of the hair on the, uh, on the coins. Uh, one can tell that the head is of a queen because she wears a flat diadem. That's to say a piece of plain white cloth, the symbol of Macedonian kingship. This combination of hairstyle, diadem and facial composition means this definitely represents Cleopatra. But is this what she actually looked like? As to the features of the face, I think one can say very little. One doesn't really know if they really looked like this. We all of us want to be able to get hold of Cleopatra and look at her. I think that's an effect produced by her mystery uh, and the story of her power. But in fact, there's almost no way of legitimating any particular object and saying this is really what Cleopatra looked like, much as we'd like to feel it. Each era has tended to look at Cleopatra's beauty and they've always talked about it. They rarely ignore the fact of her looks, whereas nobody cares what Antony looked like or Julius Caesar. They never ask what colour skin they had or hair, whether or not they were particularly handsome. But Cleopatra needs to be beautiful. And she needs to be beautiful in a way that each era understands. So as concepts of a woman's figure, the shape of her face, her colouring, her hair, as those change, Cleopatra tends to be adapted 
adapted. So she can be blonde, she can be dark, she can be anything that imagination conjures up because her beauty is largely something of our imagination. Whether she was beautiful or not, it was the Romans who set the agenda. And Roman's spin about Cleopatra has endured right up to the modern day. Above all, it suited them to cast her as so beautiful she was irresistible, because that way it didn't suggest their great men were weak. In fact, the Romans went so far as to paint her as a dangerous sexual predator who preyed on the men who fell into her clutches. Her carefully planned seduction of Julius Caesar, the most powerful man in Rome, has become a key part of her story in all subsequent eras. From Queen Cleopatra, may I? If Cleopatra did set out to seduce Caesar, then she had good reason to. She had just been deposed from her throne. If she couldn't win Caesar's support, she was as good as dead. Observe Caesar, a most unusual desire. Yeah. Greetings to Caesar from Egypt. She strikes me as a young woman who knew exactly how to get what she wanted and just captivates him and captivates him in a paternal way. Um, I really don't think it had anything to do with sex. I think that came later. It's a great story. Cleopatra tricking her way into Caesar's chamber and then using all her feminine charms to get him into bed. But when you dig a little deeper, you start to draw some rather different conclusions. Cleopatra was just 22 and in a desperate situation, fearing for her life and extremely vulnerable. Caesar was 52 and at the height of his power a well-known womanizer with previous form in bedding queens. I know who I think probably did the seducing. We learn a lot about Cleopatra's sexual activity from the Romans, and they have some explaining to do because Caesar should be a hero to them, and yet he quite clearly has this slightly seedy episode in his life when he's consorting with an enemy of Rome, although at the time she wasn't an enemy of Rome. The best way for them to explain this is that she seduces him away from everything that's proper. He's seduced away from Roman life, from Roman wives, from Roman motherhood, and into a very Eastern, louche way of behaving. You can put all the blame on Cleopatra. It makes him the innocent man who is tempted away by the woman. Even if Cleopatra did use her sexuality, it was a successful strategy. She regained her throne and saved her own life. But she was cast as a villain by the Roman people who were scandalized by her relationship with Caesar, which, as Time Watch examined, soon went beyond a mere affair. In early 47 BC, she took Caesar on a cruise up the Nile to see and be seen. The Ptolemies had a state barge that was rather like a floating Parthenon. It even had five restaurants in it, three Greek and two Egyptian. There was a tradition of impressing visiting Romans, senators, high up people in the army. So Cleopatra's invitation to Caesar to go up the Nile with her and see the delights of her country was not entirely unusual. What was different about it was that at the end of the trip, Cleopatra becomes pregnant. Cleopatra bore Julius Caesar a son, Caesarian, and over the next few years, she made at least one visit to Rome, where the presence of the Egyptian queen outraged the Republican Roman people. 
But what's often been overlooked by historians down the ages is Cleopatra's role as a mother, which Caesar himself seems to have believed was central to who she was. One thing that is very remarkable, it's very difficult to know exactly how much to make of it, but there is some evidence of Caesar in Rome putting up a statue of Cleopatra in the temple of Venus Genetrix. Venus is a remarkable person to choose. That is the Venus who brings forth life, Venus who is also the mother. And he had that statue covered in gold. Now that image holds together the notions of a fully sexual woman who is also a maternal woman in a way that the culture we have inherited does not permit. If we look sideways to the figure of the Virgin Mary in Christianity, you can see it very clearly because the Virgin Mary is a mother. She is maternal, but she is specifically not a sexual, a fully sexual woman. She keeps apart two notions which are held together in the name and the body of Cleopatra. Cleopatra the mother is one of the, the bits of the story that tends to, tends to get lost soonest. It's been a little bit more fashionable lately in that people have talked about this sort of sense of her, makes her human, you know, she's a, she's a mother, she has these children, she cares for them, um, she wants them to succeed her even if she can't remain in power in Egypt. So all of these attempts, but it, on the whole, it tends to get left out. It doesn't really feature, and the children particularly, if they appear at all, will tend to be just as babies, as infants. That's fine, that can still be glamorous, that can still show a human side of her. The children, as they get a bit older, present more of a problem because they're a complication to the story. And throughout the ages, people tend to like their stories simple. The idea of Cleopatra as a mother has been almost airbrushed from history. But it would have been of crucial importance at the time because this appears to be the image Julius Caesar himself wanted to cultivate. But Caesar's branding exercise failed and in time the Roman public would turn against both Cleopatra and the fusion of motherhood and sexuality she represented. Roman spin was only too keen to dismiss her for using her sexuality to get her own way. By late antiquity, she was cast as little more than a prostitute. These ideas are still with us today, having travelled via the Roman authors into Renaissance art and culture, through prudish, disapproving Victorians, all the way to our Hollywood image of Cleopatra as highly sexualised and immoral. While she may have used her feminine charm to get what she wanted, there's also evidence that she would use more sinister means to hold on to power. The image of Cleopatra, the killer queen, has often emerged in the retelling of her story. In this BBC documentary, German archaeologists made a link between a tomb in Turkey and Cleopatra's murdered sister, Arsinoe. What did, you, what did you see? Just describe what the, what the scene was like. Um, I was very excited and I crawled through this um, small entrance there and came oh. in and I saw the bones. Right. The uh, long bones from the, from the legs and they really were um, partly in the one niche and partly in the other niche. I immediately thought we now have at least the skeleton of the owner of this grave chamber. How fantastic, you know, that there was someone in here, obviously of some kind of significance, mm -hmm. and to then immediately wonder, mm -hmm. you know, who, mm -hmm. why, why was somebody worth this? Mm -hmm. What was their story? It's great. Determined to discover the identity of this mysterious skeleton, Hilka had little to go on. It was incomplete. She decided to search ancient records for a woman important enough to be buried in such an unusual tomb. In the Roman accounts, she found a reference to the horrific murder of Princess Arsinoe, 
Cleopatra's sister. In the city of Ephesus, at the behest of Cleopatra, Mark Antony had her sister dragged from the temple of Artemis, and there, in this holy place, the young Arsinoe was put to death. Cassius' deal was right, and if Hilker had indeed stumbled on the bones of Arsinoe, then this was a huge find. The first ever remains of anyone from Cleopatra's family. Proof not only of a shocking murder, but also the first forensic evidence that Cleopatra was a ruthless killer. This recent documentary all too readily casts Cleopatra as a stereotypical power-crazed murderess, portraying her motivations and actions as simple elements in an ancient murder mystery. But 20 years previously, Time Watch also explored this image of Cleopatra as ruthless, but in a very different way. It delved into the context of her world, where murder was a birthright, not a choice, and it was very much kill or be killed. Cleopatra's family was descended from a Macedonian general who once saved the life of Alexander the Great. The Ptolemies had ruled Egypt for 250 years, squandering wealth and empire, becoming more ruthless, more outrageous. Mothers murdered sons, uncles raped nieces, grandfathers married granddaughters. Cleopatra comes from a long line of incestuous marriages, which I think are partly to do with tradition, partly to do with keeping it in the family, and above all, I think the fact that the women are more and more demanding of their share in power. And one automatic way to gain that is not only to be the sister of the ruling king, but to be his wife as well. If you can get both functions, then you're really doing very well indeed. And that it may well be a factor in the way that the Ptolemaic women get more and more powerful. To be a Ptolemy was to live in fear, and the people you feared most were your own family. You couldn't trust your brothers, your sisters, your parents. You couldn't trust your own children once they were old enough to be independent. And Cleopatra lived in that environment. The only way to survive was to make sure that no one else ever had the capacity to, to kill you. And in the main, the only way to do that permanently was to kill them. So, to some extent, she's a creature of her times. She was in this environment. She couldn't have been anything else. But it is worth reminding ourselves, we shouldn't view this in too romantic a haze, you know. However much we feel about her, however much we might be sympathetic to this strong, independent-minded woman in a world dominated by men, Cleopatra couldn't afford to be nice. I think that you've got to appreciate the realities of politics in her world. And it's naive um, to wring your hands over what happened uh, in, at that time. And I'd suggest, you know, people should look sideways to House of Cards. Um, you know, it's not any better. Judged by our modern moral code, Cleopatra certainly has blood on her hands. But this was an age where killing your rivals was par for the course, even if they were your own relatives. In Cleopatra's world, if you wanted to survive, you did what you had to do, even if that meant killing your own sister. Over the centuries, Cleopatra has been cast as a killer, a seductress, and of course a beauty. But one of the most enduring images of her is as a tragically doomed lover. And for this image, we have one rather well-known playwright to thank. Our separation so abides and flies, that thou residing here goes yet with me. William Shakespeare has a lot to answer for when it comes to how we view Cleopatra. His play, Antony and Cleopatra, has almost come to define the persona and the story we most closely associate with her today. He transformed her image from the whoring foreigner of the Romans to the tragic romantic heroine of the English Renaissance, 
seen through the lens of her doomed love affair with Mark Antony. However, the reality of their relationship is rather different, and Cleopatra was anything but a star-crossed lover. After Caesar's murder, Cleopatra needed a new protector. So she turned to Caesar's protege, Mark Antony, who now ruled the eastern half of the Roman world. They met at Tarsus in modern-day Turkey. And we'll go to Tarsus in a bar. The most beautiful ever seen. Everything Cleopatra's famous arrival at Tarsus in a golden barge was designed to appeal to Antony's love of luxury. Cleopatra knew exactly what she was doing and what Antony could deliver for her. I'm sure that when they meet at Tarsus in 41, both have very real political agendas. Both really need to use the other for their own political positions. They need to strengthen their own political positions in different ways. And I've no doubts at all that Cleopatra comes out a lot stronger on the throne, even than she was before. Wowed by the spectacle of Tarsus and Cleopatra's immense wealth, Mark Antony fell into bed with her, and their relationship is cemented when she bears Antony several children. They were her ticket. They were Egypt's ticket out of patronage, out of dependence, out of um, obligation. And so she was willing to sacrifice, if, if you consider it a sacrifice, and I don't think she did. This was a tool. Her body was a tool. You want a son? I'll give you a son. You want twins? I'll give you twins. Give me Egypt. We like to think of Cleopatra very much as someone who is passionate and who is ruled by her heart. And it's something that the Romans also promoted. They weren't particularly keen on portraying her as an astute, sensible politician. They wanted to show her as a weak woman who was, who was falling into all the feminine traps of, of not thinking logically, being ruled by her heart. We like that too. We still find it difficult to accept powerful women who behave in a logical way. With Antony and Cleopatra, the romance always tends to loom large. After all, there aren't many romances between two people who are important political leaders. And it's the politics that tends to suffer as a result, because when you're looking at the human drama, you're looking at the passion, you're looking at their suicides so close to each other after they've suffered defeat, then it's all about that, but you forget the context of it all. Cleopatra depended throughout her life on having Roman backing. She needed to make sure that she stayed alive, which meant staying queen. The only way to do that was to get the Romans to back you. Egypt was not meaningfully independent at this point. It was very much part of Rome's sphere of influence. The problem is the Romans keep having civil wars, so you never know which lot of Romans you've got to get to support you. Seemingly under her spell, Mark Antony openly pushed Cleopatra's agenda. The historian Plutarch summed up how the Romans now viewed their relationship. Such being Antony's nature, the love for Cleopatra that now entered his life came as the final and crowning mischief that could befall him. It excited to the point of madness many passions that had hitherto lain concealed and stifled and corrupted all those qualities in him that were still capable of resisting temptation. Now, this coin, minted at Antioch, exemplifies Roman fears. It shows on one side Antony and on the other Cleopatra. In two successive settlements, Antony redrew the map of the east. In 37 BC, he gave to Cleopatra what had once comprised the Ptolemaic Empire, the richest cities of the Middle East. Three years later, in a triumphal ceremony in Alexandria, he recognized as his own the children Cleopatra had borne by him. He gave their daughter, named Cleopatra of the Moon, age six, Libya and Crete. Her twin, Alexander the Sun, was made ruler of Media. Their other son, Ptolemy Philadelphus, was made king of Asia Minor. Cleopatra had reached the zenith of her power. She'd saved Egypt, and her children would now rule most of the eastern Mediterranean.
Now, she hadn't done all this just by being the romantic heroine of Shakespeare or the sexy temptress the Romans liked to write her off as. Instead, the evidence suggests that she was a hard-headed and canny politician who knew how to get what she wanted. But this isn't the enduring image we're left with, because the romantic fantasy is quite simply an easier story to sell. For nearly two millennia, mostly male authors have defined Cleopatra almost exclusively through her relationships with powerful men, rather than judging her on her own merit. What's often missed in the retelling of Cleopatra's story is her real skill as a leader and ruler. Her father had squandered a fortune bribing Rome not to invade, so when she came to the throne, Cleopatra found her country almost bankrupt. But she'd been raised to rule. She had a very clear understanding of how to govern her country and how to get her economy back on track. In fact, she knew her country intimately and knew how to make Egypt work to her advantage. The key was to align herself with the temples, which were a powerhouse of the economy. I think it's very significant that within perhaps a month of coming to the throne, Cleopatra has gone south. She sailed right up to our mount. She's to be seen as she goes up there in her royal barge. You can imagine people coming to the banks and watching as she went by. And she ends up for what's a very important religious ceremony in which she herself takes part. From the temples comes wealth. So Cleopatra realizes that keeping in with the Egyptian religion is not simply a marvelous theatrical event. It is the key to getting the economy moving again. So she makes donations to temples. She takes an interest in the things that go on there. And above all, she cultivates them, almost literally, as a source of wealth and a source of support. But Cleopatra knew that the prosperity of the temples and of Egypt depended on the River Nile. If it came high enough, then the harvest was secure. But several times in Cleopatra's reign, the Nile failed to flood. With starvation and unrest looming, she issued a series of royal decrees, giving the peasants protection while getting the harvest in, alleviating their tax burden, making sure that the corn supply to Alexandria was secure. Without her country, she couldn't survive. But I think she identifies with her country enough to realize that it's not a matter of just using the country, that the country is her, that she's intimately bound up with Egypt. And the future of Egypt vis-a-vis -vis Rome, which is a very major problem, um, depends on the unity of the queen and country together. Economic know-how, strategic thinking and savvy management aren't necessarily the attributes we'd associate with Cleopatra. We certainly don't inherit a picture of her as a competent ruler from the modern stereotypes or the classical accounts. But perhaps we should. Recent biographies and histories are starting to acknowledge the successful aspects of her rule. Not only was Cleopatra a great administrator, she was also adept at her own brand management, especially in how she projected her image to her subjects. At Dendra, a huge temple complex in the south of Egypt, Cleopatra carried on building the great temples started by her father. Here, she mapped the future of her dynasty through her son, Caesarion. By studying the iconography at Dendra, Modern historians have discovered that Cleopatra was in fact a brilliant propagandist, especially when it came to showing how ordinary Egyptians should see her. But famous as this wall is, its hieroglyphs have never been translated. John Ray has studied them for Time Watch and believes their significance goes beyond that of conventional temple inscriptions. Egyptian hieroglyphs are about ideas rather like crossword puzzle clues that are designed to make you think about them. 
you have to tease out their meaning. Cleopatra's name appears high up, but buried further down the wall is a string of epithets describing her qualities. Great of strength, might, power. She wants to be seen as somebody who is a world power, as a performer on the stage in her own right. There she is, great in might. And here, behind the two goddesses, we have a quite simple and rather pleasant title. Good of counsel, good of policy. She wants to show herself as a wise ruler, as a capable ruler, as somebody whose rule over Egypt is good for the Egyptians themselves. The scenes on Egyptian temple walls are highly conventional. The monarch makes offerings for the people to the deities. But John Ray has discovered a deliberate telling irony in Cleopatra's choice of goddess. The reliefs suggest that Cleopatra's position is a mirror image of that of the goddess Isis and therefore deserves the same respect. Now Isis is an interesting lady. She accompanies Osiris everywhere until Osiris is put to death by his enemies. So out of the union of Isis and the dead god Osiris came the new king. We're beginning, I think, to see the reason for some of the figures on this wall. Cleopatra stands at the end behind her son Caesarion. And she's like the goddess Isis that she's standing and facing on this wall. She's a single mother. There is a coded message here saying that the queen and the gods are in the same situation. Cleopatra, I think, is playing a very big game. She is dynastic to her fingertips. She obviously had a feeling of destiny that she wanted to restore the country back to being the center point of a Mediterranean empire. In the Western tradition, her skill and intelligence is often missing from her story or simply seen as another part of her deviousness. However, that's not how all cultures see this Egyptian queen. In the Islamic world, which was largely free of Roman propaganda about Cleopatra, she's seen in a very different light. Islamic authors hail her as a virtuous scholar and focus on her positive traits, her skill as an administrator, her comfort discussing science with some of the great thinkers of the day, and as a polymath who could master everything from mathematics to philosophy. The Islamic historian Al Masudi, who lived in the 10th century, wrote a positive account of her intellectual ability and described Cleopatra as a sage, a philosopher, who elevated the ranks of scholars and enjoyed their company. She wrote books on medicine, charms and cosmetics, in addition to many other books ascribed to her, which are known to those who practice medicine. to realize how, in a culture different and separate from our own, the Cleopatra we all think we know is someone altogether different. In the Eastern world, Cleopatra is not only acknowledged as an intellectual, but also as having a clear vision for her country and a burning desire to make it a world power once again. Well, she's certainly, I mean, Cleopatra is seen in a much more positive light in the medieval Arabic sources. Um, she's seen as a very great ruler, a very clever woman, um, a great architect, scientist. Uh, she's supposed to have been a doctor of some kind, conducted medical experiments and so on. Um, and uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. And there's a, a, a difference in, in a culture that can appreciate a woman ruler um, in that way. Um, but I think it's also it's, it's also interesting that these uh, sources are often from Egypt itself, and so in a sense she's a national heroine. 
um, by that stage. In the 1920s, some Arabs even embraced Cleopatra as an icon of their nationalist cause. The Egyptian playwright Ahmed Shahi painted the queen as a nationalist heroine who dedicated her life to defending her country from the evils of Roman imperialism. When he wrote his play, The Death of Cleopatra, Egypt was under British colonial rule, so it made perfect sense to adopt Cleopatra, who also had resisted Western imperialism. Just as Cleopatra became an icon for Arab nationalists in the 1920s, Later in the 20th century, she also became the subject of a fierce debate about racial identity. When Time Watch explored Cleopatra's life in the 1990s, it did so amidst the backdrop of an academic tussle over the mystery of her race. As a child, Shelley Haley was told by her grandmother that Cleopatra was black. Shelley remembered this years later. I was teaching at Howard University, which is a historically black college. And I was teaching women in the ancient world. And we were talking about Cleopatra. And the students in the class kept asking me, was she black? Was she black? Was she black? And I kept saying, no, 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 no. She was Greek. She was Greek. She was Greek. And I can remember this as, as if it were yesterday, thinking, okay, today in class, I'm bringing in the Cambridge Ancient History so the students can see that there's a direct line from Ptolemy to Cleopatra the Seventh. I went over to the library and I got volume nine of the Cambridge Ancient History and I brought it into class and I opened it up and I unfolded the genealogy. And I said, there, see? And what I saw, what, where my finger landed was on the question mark for her grandmother. And it was like, <laughs> What's it like be stepping outside of yourself and realizing, oh my goodness, maybe my grandmother was right. If Cleopatra's black, then it opens up a whole new avenue to interpret her. And we can use the methodologies of feminist thought to project backwards and see if we can't start to untangle the complexity that, that Cleopatra was. The dominant culture does not see Cleopatra as black and does not accept Cleopatra as black. Why isn't there a counter charge against these people that that's um, taking it from the context of Roman and Greek or whatever? Why, why don't they have the burden of proof to prove that she was white? Because they don't know either. Well, in the 80s and 90s, in the face of the bold assertions of Cleopatra's uh, European origins, um, African-Americans were, of course, outraged and felt they had to step up to the plate about this. Um, and also there was a development, a boom in African-American studies, uh, which meant that there was a much more substantial intellectual backing for arguing the case. Um, you know, a lot of nonsense is, has been um, written and spoken on both sides. Uh, but you can see what's at stake, the identity. It's a question of identity, the identity of the classicists who want to uphold the superiority of what they are um, teaching and discussing and the identity of the African-Americans who want to uphold desperately and appropriately trying to regain the dignity they've been robbed of. If Cleopatra had been black, I find it amazing that the Romans, who found everything else to throw against her that they could, never bothered to mention the fact. 
It's true that we don't know for sure who her mother was. It's true that we don't know for sure who her father's mother was. And there was a tradition that her father's mother was uh, was a concubine rather than the queen. That in itself is disputable. It's very hard to be sure about that. But in all the propaganda thrown around, wouldn't somebody have said that she had a slightly dusky appearance? We don't know if Cleopatra was black, but was color an issue then? In a contemporary painting of a ceremony to Isis, the goddess with whom Cleopatra identified, black priests and white serve as equals. It seems quite likely that they wouldn't actually have been very interested themselves in what race Cleopatra was, I put it in inverted commas. You can argue that her family was Macedonian, but then you leave out of account the fact that there were all those queens uh, and all those children. Now, even in perfectly ordinary families, uh, nowadays with, with rather modest access to, uh, to um, sexual pleasure, it can be quite difficult to know who the fathers of children are. Uh, you know the exp the American expression, mama's baby, papa's maybe, that, you know, paternity is uncertain. In 2009, the discovery of this skeleton, believed to be Arsinoe, Cleopatra's sister, once again raised the issue of her race. Until recently, Cleopatra's dynasty was thought to be Greek, European, Caucasian. But some scholars now believe Cleopatra and her siblings had African blood. Could the answer be in this skull? The distance from the forehead to the back of the skull is long in relation to the overall height of the cranium. And that's something that you see quite frequently in certain populations, one of which is ancient Egyptians. Another would be um, black African groups will also show that characteristic. Um, this one certainly looks more white European, but it has got this long head shape. It could suggest a, a mixture of ancestry. Our revelation backs up the controversial theory that the princess, and therefore her sister Cleopatra, also had African blood. The issue of Cleopatra's race is a fascinating one. And in the Western world, especially the US, it's one that's laden with symbolism, set against a backdrop of colonialism and slavery. It is one of those striking things. It tells us far more about our own preoccupations when we start wondering about whether or not Cleopatra was black, was brown, was dark-skinned, light-skinned, what kind of hair she had. It's very interesting that in the ancient world, nobody seems concerned with that at all. And those aspects of race are not big. The Greeks and Romans don't talk about them, really. They, they have all sorts of other prejudices about peoples and their societies, but it's not the physical aspect. But we have this sense that it's important, but it is striking that people will argue about Cleopatra's ethnicity, the shape of her face, her coloring, and reconstructions of her tend to vary depending on the preoccupations and the prejudices of the person doing it at the time. Um, the truth is we don't know. The fact that we still argue about her beauty, race, or sexuality, is a testament to her enduring appeal. But a key part of her legend is down to the fact that she took her own life in such a dramatic and tragic style. In fact, her legendary suicide became almost inevitable as events played out. In 31 BC, Cleopatra and Mark Antony went to war with the western half of the Roman Empire under Octavian. Their forces met in a decisive naval battle at Actium in Greece. Cleopatra and Mark Antony lost. Antony was doomed, so he took his own life. Cleopatra was now alone and vulnerable. She too knew her own end was near. Cleopatra realized that her vision 
for Egypt was dead. It was dead. Egypt is the center. That's, that is her whole life. Other things can happen around the perimeter, but Egypt's always at the center. Cleopatra spent her life fighting the Romans. Octavian's now won. Antony's dead. What choice is there left her? She could be taken alive, taken to Rome, paraded in triumph for all the Romans to see this Eastern queen there captive. She's not prepared to let that happen. And the death that she chooses is a death which makes a very strong statement. The royal snake of Egypt was the cobra, or asp, whose bite conferred eternal life. This would be an Egyptian death. Plutarch wrote that she summoned a snake expert who smuggled one past her guards in a basket of figs. His equivalent today is Nasser Tolba. Cleopatra lived and died in Alexandria, which is the habitat of the most vicious cobra of all, the coastal cobra. Its fangs are very sharp, and it can bite up to ten people, killing them easily and quickly. I definitely would have given her the same kind of cobra, as opposed to other types of poison taken via the mouth to the gut. The cobra's venom goes straight into the bloodstream, and so is far more effective. For that reason, if I was with that great woman and wanted to do her a favor, I would have given her a cobra as a means of easy, quick, and painless death. And dying in this way, she's achieving immortality, the Egyptian way. So it's not just the Romans that she's cheating. She's almost cheating death itself. We don't really know what happened when Cleopatra died. She, she goes into a room and she dies in it. It's generally accepted that she killed herself, and this is what the Romans think, although they don't know how. The story of the snake kind of develops later and then it becomes two snakes. It's also been suggested that she might have been killed, that it was convenient for Octavian to get rid of her rather than having an enemy hanging round. And there's a lot of sense in that one too. Personally, I think she probably did commit suicide because she had a very Macedonian Greek upbringing and to the Greeks, suicide is a very viable option. It's not an opting out, it's a positive action. And I think that's what she did. But again, like so much about Cleopatra, we probably will never know. Part of Cleopatra's mystique does rely on the fact that she killed herself, she took her own life. And of course, that meant she died relatively young. She's only in her late 30s. So, like all great beauties, all romantic figures, if people obsess about their appearance, it's easier if they die before they get too old. And Cleopatra, the grandmother, somehow doesn't fit with the modern stereotype. When Rome learned it had won the wealth of Egypt, interest rates fell from 12 to 4%. Octavian continued building at Dendera, adding a shrine to Isis opposite the reliefs of Cleopatra. He allowed her three remaining children to live in peace. In Rome, her gold-clad statue as Venus stood for 300 years. Octavian now called himself Augustus, transporting a huge obelisk to Rome, telling the people he had conquered Egypt on their behalf. But he couldn't forget Cleopatra, and he made sure we never will. Augustus founded his reign on her defeat in the very specific way that when he was about to have a month named in his honor, 
instead of choosing the month of September, which would have been normal, the ninth month, because that was the month he was born in, he chose to have the eighth month, which was the month in which Cleopatra committed suicide, to have that month named after him. And we are still living in that moment in the sense that the eighth month we call August. So we're still celebrating the death of Cleopatra every year. Cleopatra becomes a dream. Cleopatra becomes an alternative. And she's obviously especially appealing for anyone who decides they don't really like what actually happened. So you get all sorts of claims about how wonderful the world would have been if Antony and Cleopatra had only won. No real basis for them, A, because obviously they lost, but also she didn't champion any particular causes. She wasn't particularly popular in uh, with her own people because she couldn't afford to be. She didn't have time to waste on that sort of thing. She didn't really make any major contributions to Greco-Roman culture in a wider sense, apart from being spectacular and dying in this way. So our legacy is very much of the fame and the romance and the drama. There's very little that's concrete about her because in the end she lost. In a sense, she's left us with a puzzle because our skepticism as we go into the evidence for what we've been told about her draws us on to unpicking what is propaganda and to seeking more deeply into what is actually evidence. I think you could see Cleopatra as a blank canvas that people have projected their own images onto. But the truth is there's so much evidence from the Roman sources, so many opinions about her, so, ma so much information about her, that I think what we're actually tempted to do is to project Roman views onto that canvas she left us. We might never know the real Cleopatra. Two millennia of myth, propaganda and dramatic license may well have buried the truth forever. But over time, even that fictional character, who she is, what she represents, has changed. To the Romans, an evil Eastern harlot crushed by moral Rome. To the Islamic world, an enlightened ruler and a scholar. But for audiences watching everything from Shakespeare to Hollywood blockbusters, one image has tended to hold sway. The archetypal femme fatale, beautiful and sexy, but with a romantic, tragic twist. Everyone has a different image of Cleopatra in their mind's eye. A strong woman of color, a star-crossed lover, a scheming seductress, or a ravishing beauty. But it's important to remember that underneath these superficial labels, Cleopatra was a real woman. A woman who ruled one of the greatest civilizations in the ancient world. A woman who died trying to save her kingdom from Roman domination. And the fact that it was the writings of her Roman enemies that guaranteed her fame is perhaps the ultimate testament to just how remarkable a woman she really was. Meet the maverick who rescued the pyramids from the plunder of tomb raiders, the man who discovered Egypt, here on BBC4, next.